Let's stay standing for the reading of God's Word this morning. If you have your copy of God's Word with you, you can turn to Galatians chapter 3, verse number 1. Or follow along on the screen, or do both. Galatians chapter 3. Reading in the Lord's name this morning. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? The first phrase is to a church that was born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, and performing miracles. And he says, O foolish river of life. O foolish Galatians. You can put any church's name in there. Who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified eyewitnesses to the event here in Galatia. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Father, we thank you for this letter to the church in Galatia. We thank you for the insights that it provides for us still today. We pray that this word becomes real and relevant to us, that it impacts our lives and we will be changed because we heard it from a living God that cares for us deeply and wants the best for his children. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We had four sermons in the series titled Family. And we took a two-week break. And there's two more here to conclude this series. Uh, These last two sermons take on a little different flavor, a little different direction. But yet they're still part of the family series. After these two weeks are up, we move into a series uh, from the cross to Pentecost. Actually, it's a pretty big block of time, but we're going to go from from, uh, the events before Resurrection Sunday after all the way to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which is Pentecost. But today, we continue on this journey in the family series. And we're going to take a little in-depth look at the power of the enemy. If you notice in the bulletin, it says the fallen family, uh, which is interesting. Uh, We we live in a fallen world. We live in a broken world. Your spirit is housed in a tent called the flesh, which is corrupt. The flesh didn't get saved. The spirit did. Uh, How does this all work out? How does this play out? How are we supposed to deal with this? Uh, We're going to take a look at the enemy's ability to corrupt your life. John 10.10 says he not only wants to corrupt your life, but he came to kill it, steal it, and destroy it. That's his ultimate goal. Very few sermons do you ever hear on the power of witchcraft in the church. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And this whole series was based around two questions. What do you want other people to say about your family? If outside people were to come to your door and say, this is what I see in your family, what would you want them to say? The second question was, what would you want God to say about your family? God shows up, knocks on your door, says, hey, this is what I see. What would you want God to say about your family? This sermon is directly pertaining to what God would say about your family. To understand the power of the enemy which can be consumed, uh, almost the totality of it. And this word, I know some of you are going to throw up a barrier right away, is witchcraft. Now, I I just want you to remove that barrier, because when you hear the word witchcraft, you're thinking, oh, but let's look at it. And there's barriers that you have to have to be taken down in your family, in your personal life, in order for God to effectively work in your life. 
First word I want to take apart is the second word in this text, foolish. The word foolish means an unwillingness, an unwillingness on your part. Not God's, not the Holy Spirit, an unwillingness on your part to use your brain. I'm paraphrasing this. This is, comes out of Tyndale's dictionary. The unwillingness to use your mental faculties to understand. So in other words, you're, 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 you're willingly setting aside your ability to understand. Now some of you are saying, whoa, I would never do that when it comes to God's word, yet about 100% of us do it. You willingly set aside your ability to understand. That's what he's saying. That you unwilling people, you unwilling Galatians. Now, second word uh, that comes up in multiple places in Scripture, many times in the Old Testament, is witchcraft. Witchcraft, sorcery, and magic can all be used as the same word. It takes on different forms in the English language, but in the Greek it's translated as the same word. Look at the meaning. To deceive people by devious and crafty means. Don't look at your wife or your husband right there. <laughs> To deceive people by devious and crafty means, literally through black magic with evil intent. That sounds like the devil, doesn't it? That's, that's what it is. Now, key word, an attempt. Attempt. Doesn't mean he can. An attempt to influence or control people or events through supernatural forces. These forces are called upon by means of ceremonies, recitation of spells, charms, chants. Ever been to a church where they chant? Or other forms of ritual. Practice whose adher adherents claim. There's your second key word. They attempt and they claim. Doesn't mean they can or they will. They can only attempt or they claim to have supernatural powers and knowledge, the ability to foretell the future, summon evil spirits through charms, magic spells, sorcerers, or presence in the high courts of Egypt. And in fact, we see it quite often in the Old Testament where this type of uh, supernatural power is there. Okay, let's summarize it. Witchcraft, sorcery, and magic can be summarized like this. It's to influence people for the sole purpose to control them, manipulate them, intimidate them, and dominate them. Let me say that again. It can be summarized for the sole purpose to influence people, to control them, manipulate them, intimidate them, and dominate them. That's the power of the enemy. Now, let's apply that to the fall. It's all right there. The enemy seduced Eve with an influence that he placed upon her. He was influencing her for the sole purpose to control her, manipulate her, intimidate her, and dominate her. It's witchcraft. It's the power of the enemy. So, let's look at this today from a viewpoint of you. Have you ever been a person who has wanted to control somebody? Have you ever wanted to be a person who could dominate someone, influence someone, manipulate? These are big words. So I'm going to give you three barriers today that, that I want you to look at to come down and to say, okay, I, I want these barriers removed, and it's only going to happen through the work of the Holy Spirit. And if these barriers are removed, I'll get to see a lot better than what I'm seeing right now. Because as long as these barriers are there, the enemy has you. And one of the reasons you're a Christian is not to be seduced into the ways of the evil one. Look at Galatians, just a few chapters later, again, chapter 5, verse 19 through 20. Paul continues to hammer away at this, and he says, now listen, if, if you're slipped into this witchcraft into the church, here, here's what it looks like. The works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry. Oh, we don't have any idolatry in the United States, do we? About 10 years ago, I had a guy actually tell me that in church. He says, you know, that's an Old Testament term. 
We don't worship things today. And, and he, was, he was so consumed with the fact that we don't have little golden figures up here as idols. But after I talked to him about five minutes, he was like, ouch. Yeah, we do have idols. Idolatry. Here's our word, sorcery. There's the witchcraft. Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. You ever see a church that has divisions in it? Envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things of the like. I warn you, as I warned you before. It's like he's slapping these people around. That those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Here's what Paul is saying. Listen, you started out in a direction filled with the Holy Spirit. All of a sudden you gave it up and you went sideways into witchcraft. You foolish people. Charles Blomberg, 1829. Many of you have probably heard about him. Stretched an 1,100-foot cable across Niagara Falls. 1829. It's a few years ago. I would like to know how he got the cable across, but uh, that's just me. So he stretches a cable across Niagara Falls. He walks across. He got to the other side. Everybody cheered and clapped. He went back. When he got to the other side, he grabbed a chair. Walked halfway out, sat on a chair on the cable on one leg. Not only did he sit on the chair on one leg on the middle of the cable, he cooked himself a meal on chair on one leg on the cable. Then he got to the other side. And he says, he had a wheelbarrow, and he says, is there anybody here who would be willing to sit in the wheelbarrow while I put you across? <laughs> they did. Then he got to the wheelbarrow to the other side. His manager got on his back, and he walked across again with his manager on his back. Blomberg did this for a whole day. And the story goes on. All the different things he did on this cable across Niagara Falls. Now, let me ask you this question. You're standing in the audience, and Blomberg says, hey, I'm going to take you with me. Yeah, I'll go. Oof. Let's say you go. You get on his back. You get halfway out there, and you start to get scared, and you say, hey, I don't want to do this anymore. Let me off. <laughs> Would you get off? That's what Christians do. They get saved. They put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ. They get halfway into the life and they say, hey, had enough. I can do this on my own. Let me off. How crazy does that look? That's the picture of the church in Galatia. That's the picture for many, many, many Christians who get filled with the Holy Spirit, all excited about church, going in a direction, and hey, I get halfway into this thing. I can do it. Paul says that if you slip into this mentality of trying to do it yourself, you're getting off of the back of Jesus halfway across life, and guess what? You're not going to make it. In fact, he takes it one step further right after the verses I just read. He says, if you actually think you can do this, you're under a curse. It's called the curse of the law, trying to do it on your own. I just want you to have that picture of Blomberg. You are on Jesus' back. He's the one carrying you through the life. He has shed his blood to forgive your sins, redeemed you from sin, death, hell, and the grave, brought you into light, clothes you with the robe of righteousness, and how crazy is it that we then say, I can do it. It's all from the enemy, from the word called rich witchcraft. Three key words. Manipulation, intimidation, and domination. So your first barrier today is that you have to look in the mirror. The first barrier is the flesh. The first barrier is the tent in which your spirit is housed in, is fallen and broken, living in a broken world, and the flesh is highly manipulative. The only reason I'm explaining this all to you today is because Christians many times fail to understand the power of the dark because they don't think they need to, yet you do. It, it's like understanding your lawnmower, understanding your car, understanding your sewing machine. I mean, how many of you attempt to run a machine without understanding it? 
And that's part of my background. But if you don't understand a machine, how, how are you going to work with it? How are you going to fix it? And we as Christians, if, I'm sorry if I'm calling you a machine today, but you need to know how you operate. You need to know how the enemy operates. You need to know how you function, how it functions, how God functions. So we're going to look at the machine, and the first thing you've got to look at is you've got to look at the machine in the mirror. We're in the middle of a series on family. Families have structure. The man is the head of the house. The woman is his beam, the pillar, the pair that works together. And then there's children. And when you look into the mirror and see this structure, the first part of the family I want to look at today is the children. The children. Guess who are used the most by the enemy to be manipulative? The child. You ever see a child act out? No, nobody's ever seen that, have you? Have you ever seen your own children act out? They are being under the manipulation of witchcraft. You ever see a child throw a tantrum on Sunday morning when mom and dad are about to head out the door to church? Does that just happen by coincidence? Every Sunday morning, 9.30, Junior just lays on the floor and flops around. That's not by accident. Children are highly manipulative. Mom makes a box of, co- a box of cookies, a, a pan of cookies, puts them out on the table. Hey, kids, I'm having, what do moms do, card club, bridge, whatever. Don't touch the cookies. What do kids do? Oh, come on, Mom, I can have just one. They're not going to notice. Kids are manipulative. Listen, and you can see the order in the family, dad, mom, children, and if the children are over here, being manipulative, acting out, they're under the influence of witchcraft. They're under the influence of the evil one. And you need to know that as parents because it must be addressed. Because that's a way that the enemy can get right into your house and tear the family dynamics apart. What are your children acting like? What are your neighbor's children acting like? And I'm not calling any of you bad people, but this is the real deal because he will attack the innocent children. What were Adam and Eve? God's children. Who does the enemy always attack? Attacks the children. Be aware of how your children are are attacked and how they're acting. Now, it's not that hard. This beautiful brunette right here gave us an illustration on how to do it with our grandson. If your child's acting out, he's being manipulative, throwing a tantrum, Let him throw his tantrum, but just put your hand out and say, hey, in the name of Jesus, I declare that this form of witchcraft that's over my child be removed in the strong name of Jesus. Boom, they have to leave. You know how many parents never do that? Do it. And then you might be surprised the kid will go to sleep. He'll be like, whoa, killed him. No. (laughs) You you got the witchcraft off of them, and and they're like, ah, it works. It works. That's what we're supposed to do. Okay, children, wives. Wives, very manipulative. Guys, you're going to get the same, same degree. Here, here's what women do. Well, you have a fight with your husband. Burn the hamburgers to a crisp. <laughs> Throw them on the plate. Here, deal with that. <laughs> Slam the cupboard doors. <laughs> you know how a man's manipulative? He's, he's bigger in stature. Right? Most men are bigger than the gals. So a man has a lot of, of mass. He's authoritative. And he'll throw his weight around, literally. Raise his voice, start getting angry. And all the kids, the whole household gets quiet. And everybody starts tiptoeing around dad. Don't want to get dad mad. Intimidation. A man will control through intimidation. Women will control through manipulation. Children will control through manipulation. All under the auspice and form of witchcraft. See, and we think, well, this stuff, well, that's just him. Well, that's just her. Well, that's just Junior. No, it's not. It's not being aware of the enemy and his seductive ways. And once you learn this, once your eyes are open to this today, to realize that this is dark, this is evil, this is intimidation, manipulation, and domination at its worst form, and you need to say, in the name of Jesus, I demand that this curse this witchcraft leave and it has to scripture tells us that so don't be afraid to call it out the divine order the divine order is for a man and a woman to sit down and talk 
the divine order is for the mom and dad to sit down and talk to their kid. Millions and millions and millions of couples never do that. Millions and millions and millions of kids never get told that they're being manipulated by the enemy. Sit down and talk about it. This is the real deal. He came to kill, steal, and destroy. Bring your differences into the light. As long as you don't talk about it, they're in the dark. The enemy operates in the dark. Jesus operates in the light. Talk about it and bring it into the light. Ginger and I mastered the art of talking for the first 25 years of our marriage. And what we learned is we never talked about what we needed to talk about. We talked about everything, but we didn't talk about what we needed to talk about. And when a, when a counselor told us that, we, you have the gift of communicating, now just communicate about what you need to communicate about. It's not that tough. The other one in your family is, under the power of witchcraft, is guilt. One of the main areas that he will attack is guilt. And if your kids are being manipulative, they will make you feel guilty. If the wife is being manipulative, she'll make him feel guilty. If he's intimidating, he's going to make her feel guilty. Well, I went to the hospital and you never even brought me flowers. Guilt. I went to the dentist and you never even called to see how I did. Guilt. You never listened to me. Guilt. Guilt has no end. Guilt continues. Guilt's not normal. Guilt's from the enemy. Guilt has, has a forever attachment with it. Guess what? The Holy Spirit, uh, Acts 24, 13, does not say that the Holy Spirit convicts you through guilt. Anybody just know that I quoted a verse in the Bible that does not exist? There's no such thing as Acts 24. If you're operating under guilt, be careful. It's a form of witchcraft. Look at James 1.14. Each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his what? His own desires. He's tempted, lured, and enticed by his own desires. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. I didn't say that. God's Word did. Be careful. Look at the flesh. That's your first barrier. Second barrier. Supernatural power. Supernatural power. The enemy has realms that he works in. The first and foremost one is to deal with us in the flesh. The second one is in supernatural power. More than the human ability. Listen to me loud and clear. You are spirit having a very real human experience. You're not a human having a spiritual experience. You are spirit. Say that with me. I am spirit. Your spirit is what will live forever. Having a very real human experience. And it is in this experience where you make the decision where your spirit will spend eternity. There's only two forces bidding for the final resting place of your spirit. The first one is the enemy, the dark, the devil, the witchcraft. The second one is God, through his son Jesus, through the work of the Holy Spirit. That's it. There's only two camps. There's not 34 for you to memorize here. Two. And if you're not operating in the light, you're operating in the dark. And this happens multiple times during the day. So you need to understand that your spirit, there's a supernatural power at work within you, and if you're not in the light, you're in the dark. If you're having a problem, whatever it is, and I, I don't want to even mention things because it will probably uh, feel like you're t I'm talking right to you, but there, there's something, let's just say you're having problems with pornography. And you're looking at pornography. You are operating in the dark. You're not kind of halfway in the light. You're either in the dark or you're in the light. Let's say you're having problems with idolatry. You're in the dark. He has used his influence over you to manipulate you, control you, dominate you, and intimidate you. And what happens when we do these things? Then what do you feel? Guilt. 
See the cycle? If you're not in the light with what you're doing, you're in the dark. And if you're struggling with what alcoholism, idolatry, pornography, if you're struggling with it, and when you're doing it, you're in the dark. It's witchcraft. It's the enemy totally manipulating you for the sole purpose to destroy you. And here's, here's the real crutch. Christians do this stuff. And we never talk about it in church. The only sins we talk about in church are the big ones. We don't talk about the ones that we can't see. And that's where he uses us. And then we wonder why churches get such a bad picture from the world is because the world sees the church more corrupt than the world. And the enemies at work, even in this house, this fellowship right here, the church in Galatia was saved. They said, how'd you become so stupid? Foolish people is what he says. Supernatural power that does not come from God comes from the enemy. Supernatural power has been around since the beginning. Everybody knows the story in Numbers 22. It's in the Bible, Numbers 22, 10, 13. Balak summons Balaam to, to pronounce a curse on the children of Israel. And he goes to Balak and he says, I can't do this. God told me no. And they go back and forth two or three times. Ba God says, Balaam, don't go. Balaam decides to go. I mean, God told him not to go, but he went anyway. Anybody ever done that? Anybody ever been in a situation, God says, don't do it. Well, I'm going to do it anyway. You end up having an ass talk to you? That's what the Bible says. Donkey. Talk to Balaam. I mean, it got to the point where he's on the road going to where he's not supposed to be going. The angel appears. The donkey can see it. Balaam ends up stopped. The donkey sits down, and he's beaten on him three times, and then he lays over on him. And then finally, the donkey talks to Balaam. God will use whatever means he can in a supernatural way to get your attention. And the donkey says, hey, have I not been with you since the beginning? Have I not taken you everywhere you've wanted to go? What are you doing to me today? The donkey responds. And he has a conversation with him. Supernatural forces. It was not uncommon when Balak employed Balaam to curse the children of Israel. In the Old Testament, and even today, I know it's outside of our realm of thinking, people hire priests to pronounce a curse on people. Still today. In the Old Testament, they would get these soothsayers and the sorcerers together to pronounce a curse on the other country before they'd go to war. They were very aware of supernatural powers. When David fought Goliath, Goliath pronounced a curse on Israel's God. They knew the power in the supernatural. When God led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he cursed their gods, small g. Read the story. The power of the curse in the supernatural. Acts 16, 16, Paul's going from town to town preaching the good news, and he runs into this woman that, that is a, a foreteller, and she has the gift, she's possessed, she's full of witchcraft, and there's a guy that is employing her so he can get rich. And she's known throughout the town, and she foretells the future through the dark, and the guy's getting rich, and everybody's going to her. Paul's preaching the good news, and when you read that in Acts 16, 16, it's like he finally got fed up with her, and he just turns to her, and he says, in the name of Jesus, I demand you demon to come out of her. And it did. That easy. So you need to be aware of the power in the supernatural. I sat across the table from three prominent men of another denomination in a church that I was serving, and this is what it came down to. They said, if you're going to believe and if you're going to let Jesus be the head of a church in the supernatural, how do you know that Jesus is speaking to you and not the enemy? Had I known what I know today, I would have responded this way, because the enemy operates in the dark and Jesus is in the light. Simple as that. But if we don't know how to hear, if we don't realize dark light, we can be seduced and manipulated into doing something in the dark. 2 Corinthians 12, 7, Paul says, 
So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me. There has been so many books, and I, I don't get it. So many times people always say, well, what was the thorn in the flesh? They must not be able to read. Well, I mean, look at the, look at the text. I'm not, I'm not picking on them. Surpassing greatness to the revolutions, a thorn in, given to me in the flesh, and then he says what it was. It was a messenger of Satan. I believe that Satan knew that power that Paul had in the proclaiming the good news of the gospel, that he had a, a, a dynamic force assigned to him, and that was the thorn in his flesh that he couldn't get rid of. Because he was preaching and teaching the truth. Folks, when this church functions like it should be, and why do you think I teach you the way I teach you, is because you need to know this stuff, because when you're in a Bible-believing church, praying for the Holy Spirit to move, praying for the Holy Spirit to fill people, do you think the devil's just going to walk right on by you and say, oh, I don't want anything to do with you? No, actually, he turns around, and he gives you full blast enemy dynamic witchcraft attack. And people don't know what to do with it, so they run away. Well, I'd rather go to a dead church where I'm not attacked. Because that's easier. No, it's the opposite. Tell, go ahead and attack me. I got the robe of righteousness on. I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. You can't touch me. That's all you got to tell him. And I really believe that when we function like we should be, we don't go out in the streets banging on the doors and standing on corners with megaphones inviting trouble into the church. No, we don't do that. But when we preach and teach and proclaim the glorious good news of Jesus the Christ, we will have problems. Read, read the epistles. Everywhere Paul went, there was a riot. Everywhere Paul went, there were problems. So if we want revival, if we want people to come to know Jesus Christ, and, and we want people to know that's our mission, that's our purpose, guess what? We better be ready for riots. We better be ready for the enemy to attack because we are a threat. Beware of the supernatural power. James 1.5. Here's, here's an interesting twist on supernatural power. But each person is tempted when he is lured. Oh, no, no, uh, James 1 5. If any one of you lacks wisdom, I love this verse. If you lack wisdom, ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. It's not knowledge, it's wisdom. Look at Ephesians 1 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of what? Wisdom. God wants to give you the spirit of wisdom. And the revelation in the knowledge of him. We operate the other way around. See, in the supernatural, we think, well, if I just learn enough about this, if I get enough knowledge about this, if I study the Bible enough, if I read all of the commentaries on this, if I get the knowledge about it, I'm going to have something. Listen, you are only deemed a wise man when you take the knowledge that you have and do the right thing with it. Now you're a wise man. And God says, if you lack wisdom, ask me. Because if you try to do it this way, you come under the works of the law. Because you're trying to figure it out. He says, come to me and ask for wisdom, heartfelt knowledge in your heart, and you just have to trust me, step out in faith and believe me, I'll give it to you. Supernatural power. We don't have to understand all the mysteries of God, but we can say there's a lot of mysteries of God. Because we can pray for wisdom, and when we have the wisdom in our spirit, we get it. There are so many things in Scripture. There are so many, many concepts and things that Jesus did and things in the Old Testament that I don't have a clue. And I'm your pastor. I'm willing to admit that. And it has to come under the mystery of God. I'm okay with that. I believe and I trust in the blood of Jesus Christ. Supernatural. Supernatural. One more thing in the supernatural operates in the object of potions good luck how many of you no don't raise your hand 
I, I don't want to know if you've got a good luck stone in your pocket. I don't want to know if you've got a rabbit foot hanging around your neck or you wear it once in a while or you carry it with you. If you have any sort of item like that as good luck, potion, supernatural, evil, wicked power. And guess what? The enemy will play on that. The enemy will use that. See, that rabbit's foot really didn't work. Why don't you go back to the lady to get another one? Trade that one in. Get a bigger one. Get a more powerful one. How many times have you heard the word luck? Oh, that guy's got a lot of luck. No, he doesn't. That guy's filled with the Holy Spirit. That guy's blessed. And if you're depending on luck, you're operating under the influence of witchcraft. Don't ever go to a casino and say, I wasn't very lucky. Many people do that. Drugs. I'll give up on the, the supernatural power. I've actually had a sermon series on the power of pharmakia. Pharmakia is the direct word that we get for drugs in the, in the Bible. And the enemy will use the power of music, and there's a whole other realm, and drugs in the supernatural. All of our drug culture, all of the drugs that are used today, the illegal and legal, can be a form of a supernatural power for the sole purpose to manipulate you, intimidate you, and dominate you. This is huge in America today. This is huge. Music. You ever, you ever see a kid that's listened to hard acid rock, and that's terms from my, I'm dating myself, but, you know, for an hour and a half, and you look into their eyes, it's like lights on, nobody home. It'll destroy you. For the sole purpose to manipulate you, intimidate you, and dominate you. Be careful what you're taking. Be careful what you're listening to. Be careful what you're looking at. That little song that we sang as kids is so true. Be careful the lies, what you see. It's all part of the witchcraft and dominating. Last one, last barrier that has to be tore down. Witchcraft within the church. Witchcraft within this body. Do you realize it's the number one place the enemy works? His power and his influence in the worshiping body of Christ. How did Paul know this? How did Paul come to the church in Galatia and he just comes out with both barrels blazing, you foolish people? How did he know that? Let me give you a couple indicators. They had obscured the revelation of Jesus the Christ and him crucified. Anytime a church moves off of the fact that Jesus Christ is the head of the church, it is Him crucified, it is through His death, His resurrection, His ascension, that we have everything that we have here. If we slide off of that, we've obscured the truth. That's what he was seeing. He said, listen, you foolish Galatians, you now have set into place a bunch of rules and regulations to try to maintain your position with God. And because you have done that, you are now living under a curse. If we ever implement 10 steps to salvation, come and sit me and the elders down. If we ever implement all kinds of committees and rules and regulations to this and this and this, we have slid off of the course of Jesus the Christ and him crucified. That's how Paul knew. He said, listen, you're not, you're not coming underneath of what you started with. The reality of Christ crucified has been moved through satanic power of witchcraft. You know how many dead churches there are in this country? And all of them will honestly say that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And you can ask any of them, when's the last time you asked Jesus for direction in this church? And you know what they'll tell you? It's not normative to hear from God. <laughs> I've heard that. If it's not normative to hear from God, how is Jesus going to be the head of the church? I mean, how is that supposed to work? That, that's a church that has obscured the truth of Jesus the Christ. It's normal to hear from Jesus the Christ. And if you're trying to live under that law, you've got to keep the whole law or you have failed. They missed it. He says it was credited to Abraham of righteousness because he trusted and believed God. Listen, all of us want something to boast about. I'm not, I'm not going to lie about that. 
I, I'm human. All of us want to say, hey, look at what we did. Look at what we're doing as a church. Look at, we're really somebody. We like to boast about something, but Paul says, no, you have nothing to boast about in the flesh but Christ crucified. Period. That's worth boasting about. Why does Satan want to obscure the cross? The church has two needs. The centrality of the cross is what distinguishes a Christian. The centrality of the cross and Christ crucified is what distinguishes the Christian life. If we don't believe that, you're not a Christian. If you don't believe that Jesus was the perfect sacrifice, that he was without sin, that he was conceived by the Virgin Mary, born into this world, lived a life, died, all perfect plan of God, rose again on the third day, if that's centrality to who we are, and if you don't believe that, you're under the spell of witchcraft. The power that Satan wants to obscure. The church, I firmly believe today, needs to give Jesus Christ back the position as head of the church, as stated in Ephesians. He needs to be the head of the church. He needs to be the one that we seek for answers to our questions. And how many decisions are made in this church by seeking Jesus the Christ? It better be 100%. Or we've missed it. Or we've become the church in Galatia. This sermon today was for the sole purpose to open your eyes to the power of witchcraft. In your flesh, in the supernatural, and in the church. Satan wants nothing more for this church to exist in a dead way. I used to think he would want churches to close. I don't think that's true. I think he wants churches to stay alive and be stupefied by him and be dead. And let's see how many people we can get into the doors in this system because he's keeping those people away from the power of the cross of Jesus. So he wants us to exist under his umbrella, under his spell of witchcraft for the sole purpose to intimidate, manipulate, and dominate. I hope you go home with those three words today because that's where he operates. This brings into light the nature of witchcraft. And it's real. It's real. If you've never had the evil form present itself or manifest itself into your life, now you know that if it does, you can simply say in the name of Jesus, be gone. Luther was studying to be a monk and the devil would manifest himself in human form and would stand in the corner of his little dorm room and he would wake him up and Luther would open his eyes and look at him and say, oh, it's just you, devil, and roll over and go to sleep. He has no power. He has no authority over this fellowship or over any of you who confess to believe. So don't operate under guilt, influence, control, manipulation, domination. Because if you are operating there today, you hear loud and clear, you are operating under witchcraft. And God says, no, I don't want you there. My son's job was sold, complete, everything done. You don't need to be there. Trust in him alone. Why does Satan do it? Three reasons. It's the only basis for all of God's provision for his redeemed people. Period. Hebrews 10, 14. A single offering he was perfected for all those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law on their heart. I don't know about you, but I go to bed at night and say, thank you, Jesus, for that. That I can study his word, I can read his word, I can worship in fellowship, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and guess what? I know him. You know why? Because he puts his way on your heart. And I will write them on their mind. And, then he, and people always say, why do I need to memorize scripture? It's because it's already in there. It's already in there. When you memorize scripture, it just brings the recognition of what's there. And then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Guess what? Every time sin shows up here, it's a noun. 
He's saying that when you're born again, the old person's gone, the new person has come. I don't remember that old person. I don't remember their old ways. I will remember that old person no more. I will remember their sins no more, their lawless deeds no more. If any of you are struggling with guilt or condemnation today, it's from the enemy, it's the spirit of witchcraft. And if that old life is still dominating you today, you just stand up at the end of the service today and when you come forward to take communion, praise God and say, hey, in the name of Jesus, I know you don't remember my sins anymore. I don't want to remember them anymore either. Take it away because I know that the blood of Jesus the Christ was a complete work. That's enough just to walk out of here and run up and down the streets and say, I've been born again and God doesn't remember my past. That's encouraging. Not only that, he says, where there is forgiveness of these, no longer any offering of sin. You know what that means? That, That we don't bring bulls and goats and lambs in here today. There's no more offering. So if you're operating under guilt and condemnation and you come before God, talk about idolatry, there's some denominations where you come before God every week, after week, after week, and say, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities. Here's what you're doing is you're putting Christ back on the cross. You're making him die again because the first time he died wasn't sufficient. This says that he died once and for all. There's no longer need for any more offering because his work was complete. This is why the devil gets so mad. The cross was the means of Satan's total defeat through the cross. Jesus administered administered the total irreversible defeat of the enemy. You, You wonder why he's mad? You wonder why he's after you even if you're saved? He was totally irreversible, defeated, over, lights out, game over, buzzer blue. He knows that. And he attacks those who don't know that. He'll go after us who don't confess to believe that Jesus Christ's work was complete. Satan can't change this, but he will try to conceal it. And make you believe, I don't know for sure. Lastly, the feature of the cross is the only source of power for real Christian living. Right believing produces right living. Right believing produces right living. When you believe right, you're going to live right. And that doesn't mean, and I've encountered when we were gone for two weeks, you know me, talk about the top five gifts. I didn't even know this category existed, but there's a category called woo That's why I said W-O-O, woo. Because when I read that, I was like, I think it made a mistake. That's my top gift. Woo means that you are absolutely in love with people. You like to talk to people, and you want to find out about people. And you continually seek more relationships because you simply want to know about them. That's me. And I love doing that. So we're in this park where there's about 1,500 people. Man, I had an audience. (laughs) And I had people to talk to. Ginger's like... After 30, 32 years of marriage, she knows if I don't come home for a couple hours, he's off talking to somebody. <laughs> but here's, here's what a lot of people will say. I'm a good person. I'm morally and ethically good. And they honestly believe because a loving God is all loving that he will accept me because I'm morally and ethically good. And you know what? It is a hard thing to communicate to people to tell them. That ain't going to get you there. That ain't going to work. You can be morally and ethically good, not kill, not steal, but you tried to keep the whole law, but there's part of the law that you didn't keep. And God says, if you didn't keep the whole law, you didn't keep any of it, and you're under a curse. I never told anybody that. But they have to see that that's not it. It's only through the blood of Jesus the Christ that you can be received. And the enemy has no control over you after that. Satan is completely defeated. And until you learn what I taught you today, until you understand that he's defeated, his power is gone, you don't live under the curse, you live under grace. The church in Galatia had slipped into trying to do this. If any of you are sitting here today, if anybody's listening to this today, if you're trying to maintain your relationship with God through your works, you have slipped off of the centrality of the cross and you are suffering. 
And just get that picture of that tightrope walker. What you're doing is you get halfway across there on Jesus the Christ, and you're on a tightrope, and you say, hey, I can do this on my own. You just try and get off of that. And you try and walk on that tightrope. It'll be over before you even get off. So Jesus comes along, and he says, I've done all of this for you. Keep your focus on me. Remember, as you come to commune today, what I have done for you, that my blood was sufficient. I defeated the enemy. The light's out. The world went black because I totally annihilated the power of the enemy. Look in the mirror and understand the witchcraft in the flesh, the witchcraft in the supernatural, and the witchcraft in this church. I've been... People have tried to control me in different areas. People have tried to control some of our elders and deacons. And you have to be aware of the fact that when you're in conversation or whether it's in email or wherever it is, you've got to be able to read between the lines. Is this coming at me for the sole purpose to control, to manipulate, intimidate, or dominate? And if that's the case, then you've got to look at it and say, this is the enemy. This is the enemy trying to get to me. Not only am I being attacked there, but all of you are the same way. So be very aware and simply turn it over to Jesus and say, hey, this has all been dealt with. I don't have to deal with this. Final scripture, Ephesians 6, 10 through 14. Finally, brothers, this is, this is the church in Galatia, he writes, and then he writes to the church in Ephesians, and he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Not yours. His. Stay on his back. Cling. Hang on. He did it all for you. He'll carry you to the end. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. What have I been teaching you today? Witchcraft, the schemes of the devil. He says, stand firm. Put on the whole armor of God so that you can stand firm in the face of this guy called the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the cosmic powers of the present darkness. That's what I taught you today. Against the spiritual forces of the evil in heavenly places. Did you know that there's an angelic battle going on right now to protect us to worship? Some people in this congregation have been given the insight to see it. We've had at least two people who have seen it. That while we worshiped the one Sunday, she was able to see that the heavens were open and the angels were looking down upon us. We've also had at one time where a couple people, more than one, seen angels in four corners of this fellowship. This is what Paul is talking about. Spiritual forces. Heavenly places. There's angels battling over the position of your soul as you go through your day. You confess to believe in Jesus, you're protected. And guess what? That angel's getting a workout. Because the enemy will come at it. That angel stands firm. Very few people ever start to see that. And I think when we get to heaven, we're, we're not, we're not going to fall on the ground in front of Jesus. because uh, We are because of the awesomeness of who he is. But we're also going to fall down on the ground for the very fact, for the first time, we will see what we have. And we will just be in speechless awe of what went on for our position. Therefore, there's a bridge. What's it there for? Therefore, he sums it up last sentence. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. You know what the standing firm is? Confess to believe in Jesus. Close you with the robe of righteousness. There you go. Let's go. It's that simple. Don't try to make it any more than what it is. Witchcraft in the family is real. Witchcraft in the church is real. But after today, I've enlightened you. I've given you new information on how to see it, how to deal with it, how to be aware of it.